ahead and get started. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Julia Matevosian. I'm a chief engineer at Energy Systems Integration Group, um, or ESIG. ESIG uh, serves in a leadership role uh, with the Global Power System Transformation Consortium, or GPST. Um, GPST's mission is to bring together key actors to catalyze a rapid clean energy transition at a precedented uh, scale and speed. Uh, this is being done by providing coordinated and holistic approach to the necessary knowledge, education, and support to power system operators across uh, the five pillars. The foundation of GPST is a group of five, six system operators uh, from around the globe um, who are facing high penetration of wind and solar inverter-based resources sooner than other operators in the world. Uh, the five pillars of the consortium are research and peer learning, technical support, Workforce development, technology adoption, uh, technology adoption support, I'm sorry, and uh, open data and tools. Uh, ESIC is a lead of Pillar 1, uh, and more information on GPST can be found at www.globalpst.org. Uh, as the lead of Pillar 1, ESIC would like to welcome you all to April monthly webinar uh, of our joint GPST Pillar 1 ESIC webinar series. This series is in addition to the regular ESIC monthly webinar series and focuses on the GPST research agenda and associated topics being addressed in Pillar 1. Topics are presented by the founding system operators and other advanced system operators active in Pillar 1, as well as members of industry and academia participating in activities of research agenda group and research advisory committee of uh, Pillar 1. Um, an additional series of webinars on other four pillars of GPST is also being provided on a monthly basis through National Renewable Energy Dr uh, Lab or NREL. Uh, for those of you who would like to learn more about GPST and how to engage, please go to www.globalpst.org and click on Get Involved tab. Uh, further information on ESIC can be found on ESIC.energy. Uh, next, I would like to um, walk you through some logistical matters before we get started. Uh, first of all, the phones will be muted for the duration of the webinar to avoid um, any unnecessary distraction. Uh, for Q&A, as always, we use Slido platform at slido.com. Um, you need to open browser window, uh, go to slido.com and enter E616 as an event code. The instructions are also at the bottom of the screen right now. Uh, you will see a thumbs up button next to uh, questions on Slido uh, to allow you cast your vote and help prioritize uh, questions that are submitted. Uh, we plan to save about 10 minutes for Q&A at the end and then wrap it up um, at the top of the hour. Uh, an email with link will be provided once the video has been posted. Uh, we also plan to provide short responses to all unanswered questions uh, after the webinar, so please don't hesitate to uh, cast your question on Slido. All right, so uh, today our webinar is on a framework for quantifying supply and demand of grid stability services, um, certainly an important and timely topic uh, with growing shares of inverter-based resources that we are experiencing today. Today's webinar will feature um, Matt Richwine, uh, founder, founding partner of TELUS Energy, and uh, Nick Miller, principal of Hickory Lake uh, LLC. Uh, Matt Richwine is a leader in power systems engineering, power electronic controls, and system stability. Prior to funding TELUS, uh, founding TELUS uh, Energy, Matt worked uh, at GE Energy Consulting where he led a team developing new control systems for power converters and transmission planning models. Uh, Nick Miller is internationally known power system engineer with focus on integration of wind and solar generation to bulk power systems. He spent three eighths of uh, century at GE um, and just to name few of his distinctions, Nick is elected member of National Academy of Engineering, an IEEE Life Fellow and distinguished member of SIGRE. Uh, numerous patents, publications, and citations uh, form compelling evidence for Nick's long and fruitful career in power systems engineering. Um, I'm very proud to have known uh, Nick and Matt for many years now and collaborated with them on many projects. Uh, so today's webinar will focus on grid needs and services uh, as the grid transitions from synchronous machines to inverter-based resources, 
the grid services that power system needs um, to be stable, uh, they will not change, uh, but the way we define and measure those services will change. This web webinar will cover recent progress uh, on evaluation of grid services and discuss framework for parsing and quantifying stability services to help planners, operations and procurement teams better describe how much they have and what they need. Uh, this work is continuation of ESIC services task force, uh, so Nick and Matt will be also joined by Deepak Ramasubramanian from EPRI, uh, and he'll tee up some of the outcomes from initial work uh, in this area. Okay, so short reminder, once again, to use Slido at slido.com uh, with event code ESIC16 to ask your questions, and without any further ado, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Mac, Matt, Nick, and Deepak, uh, I'll now turn it over to you. Thanks, Julia. Matt, you're on mute. Ah, thank you. It was buried. Um, thank you, Julia. Um, thanks, everyone, for attending. I'm very, very happy to share some of this um, exciting material we're, we're getting into. Um, as Julia um, set this up quite well, um, we'll talk about why are we talking about this? We'll talk about some other recent work, uh, recent progress um, being done on grid services and specifically stability services is the focus of this webinar. Um, it's been uh, a lot of exciting news, I'd say, around services and markets from around the world that, that Nick will touch on. Um, as well as what the ESIG has, um, the ESIG Services Task Force has done um, with Julia's and Deepak's leadership. And then we'll get into talking about the elements of the framework um, that we're developing here and some next steps where we're going to demonstrate and exercise the framework. So, without further ado, when we think about grid services and specifically grid stability services, a few broad key questions come to mind as a good starting point. First, what services do we need? What are we talking about? I think most folks in the industry, you know, we're familiar and, and we talk kind of colloquially about inertia and how that's disappearing, but it's a lot more than that. And we want to get into that and, and add some color, um, a, a lot more color into that. And there's been a lot of uh, progress in the industry around this one about talking about the services, the different buckets, and we'll hear from Deepak momentarily about some of that. But some of the other questions that follow from that include how much, what are the units, how do you measure it? How does it change when the grid changes, depending on the commitment and dispatch of, of generation around the grid? Um, loading of different elements of the grid. How fast? There's an important time frame element um, that's been recognized in some of the, the previous work and the work that's out there today. Um, and we're going to dive into that a little bit more. And then where? Um, there's a location component and location matters for some services more than others. And so we want to take these together and develop a framework that is generalized, technology agnostic, repeatable, and scalable, and something that planners of any system can use to understand what are the services, what do we have, what do we need, and particularly as they go to look at future scenarios to evaluate those with, with these questions in this framework. So on that, I'll hand it over to Deepak to talk a little bit more about what he's done in the services task force. Thanks, Matt. So um, some of the preliminary work, as Matt said, said, was kicked off from the services task force that we had uh, from ESIG. We identified that there's not necessarily a one-to-one -one mapping between what the grid needs and uh, what the inverter-based resources can provide. Now, one thing we are going to be very careful about and intentionally careful about is the notion of labeling these kind of resources. So we're, we're not going to try to label whether an inverter-based resource is category A or category B. It's more about performance. And that's why you would see on the right-hand side of this table, different kinds of performance aspects, performance notions that can be derived from an inverter-based resource. 
And you also notice the, the many to one mapping that can happen. So uh, a particular need for the grid can be met by many different services from an inverter based resource. Uh, and a particular service from an inverter based resource can meet many needs of the of the system. So this complex structure that comes about with respect to how the inverter based resource can help the system uh, and whether this capability is actually being utilized or not, uh, that's where the entire framework that that Matt will talk about will go towards. So it, it's we're going to focus more upon the ability to utilize some of this capability. Um, and then also have a framework to obtain the capability in the system. Uh, I think the next slide just talks a little bit about some of the preliminary work that, that we had and how we try to abstract out the different scenarios that we had run, trying to understand um, across contingencies that you might see of loss of syn synchronous machines, uh, faults, and so on. Uh, depending upon whether you take an existing inverter based resource, depending upon whether you take an inverter based resource that can provide some amount of a slow kind of a service or a inverter based resource that provides fast service to the network um, and also maybe some advanced capability that can be provided, uh, you get different utilization paradigms that come up in the system. And what we also see is that depending upon how we make use of these various resources that we have on the system, the burden on the future resource changes. So um, the, the way in which we utilize, let's say, the resources today can impact how much we have to procure of a particular service in the next five years. Um, and if we don't utilize something today, maybe that procurement has to go up uh, because then the uh, resources that are going to come into the system may have to take upon the burden that is uh, already uh, there of meeting the existing resources and their needs. So we've done a little bit of that effort in the uh, preliminary work, trying to map out what kind of services, what kind of behavior, at what location in the system, uh, can they yield a, a stable or an unstable uh, response? Um, and the effort that we're going to talk about now is just to take that one step further, expand it to a larger network, uh, bring in more different types of services, try to understand how they might overlap with each other if they if they overlap at all um, and see how to better utilize it for our future network. So uh, back, back to you, Matt. Thanks, Deepak. Nick? Okay, so uh, hi everybody. Also a pleasure to be here. Um, so Matt and I have been working for a couple of years on some of these stability concepts uh, that he's going to talk about. So it, it, true to form, I will be uh, kind of here in the background as Matt proceeds through most of the material today, providing occasional color commentary. But um, yeah, we wanted to emphasize with this slide, and just sort of set the stage a little bit that, uh, that we aren't doing this in a vacuum and the industry has got lots of hot spots that are, that are uh, in various fashions addressing um, the delivery of these these uh, services and definitions of them, and I almost put a lot of time on here, but there's some leadership uh, uh, on uh, uh, present in the industry, uh, uh, ESO UK, uh, AEMO uh, in Australia, Grid in Ireland, ERCOT in the sovereign country of Texas, have each introduced or are working on variations on the on defining these. Uh, services. I don't want to go through the table, but the key point, and Matt will will dig into this, is that there is a temporal and locational riddle uh, to be unraveled for for many of these services. Where where uh, you know the the notion that that the service is is homogeneously spread across the system is at odds with both the physical reality and the stability reality. So uh, how fast and where and where are the boundaries that if if you're not talking system wide are are questions that we're hoping uh, with this with this framework to to help uh, advance. So with that, I won't say too much more. And Matt, why don't you go ahead and pick up uh, with the meat of things? Huh? 
Great. Thanks, Nick and Deepak. So as we jump in and as, as folks have alluded to, we want to share the framework that we're that we're developing. And this is a bit of a work in progress. Um, you know, we're really trying to achieve those core objectives of having something that's generalizable, um, that's technology agnostic, and that accounts or, or captures most of the cases where we see the stability services uh, playing such an important role. And to start with, we, we use a supply and demand construct in terms of on the supply side, typically we're thinking about resources, generation resources, but now there are other resources in terms of um, non-energy resources, for instance, that we'll get into, but also transmission. And in the sense that transmission is important for as part of the supply in an indirect way. And so together you can provide those services across the grid. And there's a demand for their stability services. So here again, talking about supply and demand, not in terms of energy or capacity, but really grid stability services. And so the demand looks like the dynamic events or disturbances that you would have where you're drawing on those stability services to make it through that dynamic disturbance and get back to a steady state. That in combined, you know, with demand on that side of the scale is the acceptance criteria. So, for instance, if we think about this, if we look at a grid that is stable or everything that we're used to today, we would expect the supply to outstrip the demand and the acceptance criteria. For instance, we have enough services to run the grid stably and reliably today. Now, as we look forward, that stands to change from both sides of the scale. Um, there could be the, the supply could change as the resource mix changes. Also, the demand could change. The events, the planning events, and the, the contingencies could become more severe or less severe depending on how the grid evolves. And all of that is subject to the acceptance criteria. And so, for instance, if the acceptance criteria, if the bar goes up, that creates basically more of a demand for those supply services versus if you relax your acceptance criteria, um, it just kind of changes the balance here. And so all of that is subject to, there's four main pillars or dependencies that we see here and how we're thinking about it. There's a power type, active versus reactive. So active power, we're normally talking about active power or frequency response is normally um, what we associate with active power services. On reactive power services, we're usually associating that with voltage regulation and voltage control. On the time frame pillar, there is a range. It's a continuum going from fast and then to slower services. On the location pillar, there's local or regional aspects where those services may not travel as far, and then there's network-wide services. And where some services will propagate across the entire network and look more common mode and network wide. And then there's the operations or the operational condition condition dependency where the supply or demand for these services will change depending on how the grid is being operated. And so you look at one snapshot, you have one set of operating conditions, but for instance, a different operating conditions where you have different levels of headroom uh, among your resources providing these services um, could really limit what they're able to provide at that time, as well as different loading across the system. So this isn't everything. And I just wanna highlight and acknowledge a couple important points, but they're not in scope. All right, system restoration, sometimes uh, shown or, or talked about as a black start service. You know, that's an important piece, but it's not covered in this framework here. Um, what we see system restoration, of course, is very important, but it's far more complex than having just black start, black start resources. There's lots of si switching sequences and, and, you know, different folks do it in different ways. And in, in a sense, it's kind of hard to generalize and we want to weave that in, and it's not used very often, thank goodness. Um, but we wanted to set that aside. 
The other piece that's not in scope is the protection, protection scheme. So you know, this gets closely tied in with a short circuit current or short circuit level type of service of how much fault current are you providing? And we see that as it's related to protection systems as being highly dependent on the protection scheme, the communication systems that are used, um, things like that. Again, very hard to generalize. There are some cases, some protection schemes, some grids where having high levels of fault current will be very important, but we don't see that as kind of a universal truth of all systems. And so we're setting, we're, we're setting that aside in a sense, we're not tackling this here, but we would think that, you know, a framework like this will be uh, generalizable enough and also expandable in the sense to cover some of these other possibly more system specific stability services. So what can provide these services? Again, a core tenant of this effort is to make it technology agnostic. So trying to talk about resources independent of the technology behind them. And these resources have a direct impact to the services. So we're typically accustomed to thinking about, I'm gonna try not to say it too much, but like inertia is from a synchronous machine or from, from synchronous machinery. Um, you know, that's what we're, when the, when the machine is online, you get this service, right? And that concept is, has carried us very well and very far for over a hundred years, but we want to step back from that exact definition of the service and make it more generally applicable um, to different resources, particularly inverter-based resources. Um, we're also talking about um, when it comes to reactive power services and, and voltage support, these can come from non-energy resources like statcoms, SVCs, and others, um, as well as energy resources um, where there is an energy reservoir behind them, whether it's um, a fossil fire prime mover or battery energy storage or, um, or wind or solar. These resources also, again, we're used to thinking about them in terms of generation, you know, what's that utility scale plant doing, but it's not just that. Um, load resources can also provide these services. Um, in a sense, a, a reduction in power from the load in the timeframes that are relevant for stability is very closely akin to an increase in power that you would get from a synchronous machine during an under frequency event. Um, similarly, they can be distributed or, or centralized. Um, there are different aspects of these, of course, um, but we feel that these all that this framework is accommodating of all of these and, and, and there's a lot of value to making it as such. On transmission, we see this as transmission has a, a very important role to play here in the ability to move and deliver services to different locations. Um, but in that way, the transmission in and of itself is not providing these services per se, but helping deliver the services and helping exchange uh, services with different parts of the grid. So now I'd like to go through the four pillars in a little bit more detail. Starting with the power type and time frame. Uh, this is an, just a, a broad illustration in which on the top, we're talking about active power grid services, the watts, the energy. And on the bottom, we're talking about reactive power grid services, basically voltage regulation. And depending on where on this, in this continuum of time you are, we sometimes give it a different name. But functionally, we see it all doing very similar things, just acting in a different time frame. And so I'll begin with on the top on the active power side. The fastest active power response that we're accustomed to seeing is typically called inertia um, and is typically but not exclusively uh, provided by synchronous machinery. Excuse me. Next, moving out, um, FFR being fast frequency response. Uh, we, we see this in use uh, at, in many other grids in ERCOT and also around the world and other places. And that kind of takes over as basically a faster version of primary frequency response or PFR. 
And beyond that, in the longer time scales, those are of less interest for this work. We're really focused on everything that's going to be relevant in that dynamic time frame, getting the system recovered from the disturbance and back to a new equilibrium, everything that's happening roughly inside of one minute. On the reactive power grid services side, voltage regulation, uh, we're accustomed to seeing, you know, it, it takes a, a few seconds, for instance, from our conventional like AVR type of response, whether it's coming from an excitation system or a power plant controller on an inverter based plant, um, you see that that happening is voltage regulation. And in front of that, what we see is there is a form of voltage control or regulation that is happening um, that is that we tend to associate with the word grid strength is how much are you supporting that voltage in those short time frames? Something that synchronous machinery again has done naturally through the persistence of flux in the machine itself, something that we're seeing from inverter based resources with grid forming technology being able to maintain uh, voltage control over very short time frames. So leading in, and, and again, Nick, please, uh, and Deepak jump in here if there's anything else to add. When we talk about how to get these, how to understand what each resource can provide, um, I'm going to throw at you, this is a very dense plot, um, and I'm just going to cover it at a high level, so bear with me. But what our approach is for assessing the performance of resources and really their ability to provide grid services across a range of time frames is to use a frequency scan type of approach and to view this in the frequency domain. And that's what these two plots are. They're showing the response of different real but different classes of, care, uh, of resources in the frequency domain where from the, on the left side of these plots is basically the zero hertz and DQ realm, or, or basically like a, um, a, a DC, to faster perturbations or, or faster frequency events requiring higher bandwidth. On the left side, on the left plot, you see the reactive power services. And so for the very slow response, which I've, shaded in purple here you see that this is that this is the more conventional voltage control response that you would expect to see out of excitation systems or uh, power plant controllers and as you move right uh, into the gold shaded region where the the frequency in this frequency domain plot goes up that's associated with smaller time scales and so having a response in those smaller time scales or, or being able to measure and assess the response in those smaller time scales is what is basically shown by the curves of the different resources here. And so, for instance, on reactive power, where we're quantifying dynamic admittance or the admittance of the resource, higher values here are associated with more voltage better voltage regulation and across all time frames. And you can see GFMs excel at that, synchronous machinery somewhere in the middle, and historically grid following inverters while they operate well and provide um, good voltage regulation for slow time frames and the faster time frames they don't do as well as shown on this graph. A very analogous plot has been made for active power services where you're doing kind of a, a perturbation and observation. Um, and again, you see a similar construct where now we're looking at the response of the resources, the active current response to a perturbation and voltage angle. And you see again that synchronous machinery and grid forming inverter technologies appear towards the top in terms of for those faster time frames in that blue and yellow shaded regions. They are providing a beneficial response, a stabilizing response. For synchronous machinery, we call that, we've called that inertia, um, but we really want to, again, um, have a more functional view of it. And we think that this frequency domain representation uh, gives us that. 
On to the next pillar of the locational, the location dependency. I think we're all aware that, for instance, frequency events usually cover the network at some point or in some relevant time frame. They're network wide, but not all um, services are like that. And for instance, voltage regulation and voltage support services tend to be more local or regional. And so because of this difference, we wanted a way to basically break up large systems and define groups of regions where the groups essentially, where a group is defined by a part of the grid where it all basically hangs together and dynamically um, behaves similarly. So we're all familiar with areas and zones in today's power flow models, um, but we see these as based on you know, ownership, control, historical um, evolution of the grid, for instance. Those areas and zones we don't see as reflecting the underlying fundamentals of the grid, nor how it's expected to evolve. And so we're reframing this and, and looking at specifically the, the major physical attributes for grouping the system. And there's two of those. One, there's the network connectivity or the admittance matrix, something that we're you know, very accustomed to using and seeing and understanding you know, how much is one part of the grid connected to another part of the grid, bus to bus, et cetera. But it's not just that. We also see that it's the resources that are, that are online and their characteristics play a role in how these regions behave dynamically. And whether they hang together or whether one region can have a different dynamic behavior than another region, even if they're within the same network, or maybe they behave slightly differently at different times um, after the disturbance. And so one analogy that I'm kind of testing out around the resources piece of this is to think of a resource like a buoy versus a break wall. And where you'd have buoy resources, where for instance, they have little provision of stability services, um, particularly in the faster timeframes. And so like a buoy, you know, if a wave comes, the buoy is just basically going to ride the wave and the wave is gonna pass underneath and it's not really going to affect the the propagation of that wave or the dis, it's not going to affect in a meaningful way that the propagation of a disturbance through a large network examples of these for instance are for instance grid following or gfl resources where they're primarily where where one <laughs> uh, instance of those is to just provide um, active power and may not be providing many services, particularly in the shorter time frames, or small resources that basically get over, um, just kind of pulled along with the much larger rest of the grid, or resources that are already topped out, where there's no headroom left to provide their services and to, to respond dynamically when the event happens. Um, this in contrast to break wall resources or resources with large provisions of stability services, particularly in the faster timeframes. We think of these as the large synchronous machinery plants um, or, and or large grid forming or GFM resources with headroom, provided they have that headroom and they're able to respond and react. And so like a break wall, when a wave comes, the wave does not really make it through the break wall. Um, so it really has an impact in, in kind of stopping and, and um, in a sense, stabilizing the grid um, during and after a disturbance. So how we group these, you know, again, the objective is to, to identify regions or groups that hang together dynamically. Um, this allows us to identify important interfaces between the groups. And the idea being that we can now use this to include the location component of the framework where we can identify, we can associate uh, the services, the, the services that are provided from the resources within a group and look at how much each group is contributing in terms of the supply or demand for um, those stability services.
So the supply being kind of the aggregate of the resources in a grouping, the demand being among the largest contingencies that you would see in the group. Um, not getting too much into the calculation method that we're using, but in, in short, um, we're taking an, an interaction factor approach here, looking at the ratio of changes in bus voltage, um, and we're using a hierarchical clustering algorithm for that. Um, and this enables us to quantify the groups, the coupling within a group, and the coupling between and among the groups. One really important note here is that this doesn't mean that the groups need to satisfy all of the needs within themselves. We're not doing this to, you know, take our macro grid and make a series of micro grids, nor do we think that the, any grid should be viewed that way. Um, it's more making it, allowing us to be able to take into account the locational aspects of some of those services where they know they exist. So the exchange of services between and among groups is very critical. Um, and so we're not suggesting anything otherwise. The last pillar that we wanna talk about is the operations pillar, where the dependency of services is, uh, is or the grid condition dependency. So how the grid is operating, how it's dispatched at any given moment, any given snapshot, or case file um, depends on how many uh, or, or impacts what services are available. So, for instance, uh, the supply side, the headroom constraints, the margin to the limits that you may have. And for instance, with active power limits, you can imagine a, a as shown on the right here, um, a progression in time in which you have an initial grid condition you have an event and then you have a post event grid condition. And units, if you consider the, the capability of response um, on the y-axis here, units that are already close to their maximum limit would have low headroom and therefore during an event, they would have limited ability to respond. Versus as shown in green, um, a resource with high headroom and other, in the sense where it has a lot of room to go up, assuming that this particular disturbance, this event, um, creates demand for an increase in, for instance, active power. So, you know, this has always um, existed. And if we take, for instance, our, our governor response capability of synchronous machinery, our, our primary frequency response, if a unit is dispatched at its maximum power. If it's a synchronous machine and a gas turbine in, in kind of temperature control mode and it's already maxed out, if an under frequency event happens in that governor response time frame, the governor is not going to do anything more for you. Just in the same way that if you have a wind plant or a solar plant that's operating at the at the wind or radiance that's available, it's not going to have any room to go up. Now, there are other resources, there are other services where this upper limit, I'd say, is, is temporarily uh, or permeable or it can allow temporary violations. We believe that we have, but when you combine this with the different time frames, that we will be able to account for that. For instance, for a synchronous machine, or for a synchronous machine, even if the governor is at maximum output, if you have an under frequency event, you'll still get the inertial response. That's a different time frame. It's a different bucket for the service. So in that way, we can handle that. On the demand side, um, you know, there's the, the contingency size will impact things. So a different dispatch, if your largest, um, if your largest generation contingency, for instance, is, is higher or lower, depending on how that large unit is dispatched, uh, it, it changes how much demand for services you would have at that given operating condition. So we want to bring start start to think about how to bring this all together. And by way of an example, um, looking at the supply side. And so for one case or snapshot shown here in, in this box, we're trying to illustrate how we can do basically some simple accounting 
to consider the aspects of the four pillars of our framework that we've covered. So for instance, first with power type, uh, at the top in blue, you see active power services and then a, a group on the right um, for reactive power services. Now they're subject to the operating condition dependency. They're subject to their own limits. And so that pillar comes in where the services would all be subject to active power limits or reactive power limits such that if you're going to look at a if you're going to assign a numerical value to the response for a given service for a given time frame you have to make sure that 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 there is the margin the headroom or foot room if you will um, that is there to provide it now in the columns we're looking at the time frame dependency where we have buckets for the fastest time frames, a fast and a slower time frames. And similarly, for reactive power services, we have different buckets for the faster and the slow. And so, again, if I were to use terms that um, are technology specific that we're going to get away from, but we're all familiar, on the active power side, the fastest uh, types of service we're talking about there looks like an inertial response. The fast response would look like an FFR type of response and the slow would take the shape of a, a primary frequency response or governor type of response. On the reactive power side, um, the fastest would be kind of a grid strength type of response, regulating voltage within uh, inside of a few hundred milliseconds, for instance. And the slow is everything else after that. Um, more associated with plant level controls. Going across in the rows is where we would take in the location dependency. And so, for instance, uh, a grouping A to however many groups are being considered, um, you'll have the, the contributions from the individual resources. And we've got the, the dots placeholders where we're looking to, to quantify these values from a combination of those frequency domain plots that we shared as well as also for some of the slower responses um, something more familiar like a like droop values both frequency droop or voltage droop values and to aggregate those up by a, 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 a location um, where all of those resources basically are behaving similarly and you can do those on and on through the groups and so if we boil that up one more level, you could imagine that how the, this framework would be used is you would have a series of planning cases from near term to five year to 10 year out. And you could imagine for the different buckets of services, active power stability services, reactive power stability services, we would have number of, sorry, I switched terms on everyone here. I tried not to use cluster because it's ambiguous, but the numbers of groupings with deficiencies. And in these ways, you could kind of quickly scan through and say, okay, for our near term cases, we don't have any deficiencies. That's, that's good. And we, of course, intend it to be like that. But as we get farther out in the five to 10 year time frame where the grid is changing more dramatically, we could use this as this this accounting method to essentially take inventory of the stability services that are being provided. And if you were to zoom in, for instance, on some of these where deficiencies have been identified, um, you could find more details um, by the location and by the type of service and drill down in that way. And so a lot of now, mind you, all of this we're trying to do is not you know, running a battery of really burdensome simulations, although there's going to be an aspect of that. But we think the utility here of a framework like this is that it captures everything and it can, uh, it, it captures a, a kind of a, a snapshot um, that's relatively quick and usable and again helps planners know where to put more of their attention um, and understand which future cases, which scenarios there's likely to be a deficit of services and, and where that might be. And so, okay, 
Great, Matt, thanks. You've just showed us a table with almost no numbers in it. Um, you know, what, what good is that? And so we're coming to that. Um, you know, the next step in this work in process effort that's going through the remainder of the year is the demonstration uh, of the method intended to exercise this framework. We're not going to perform necessary specific study with a specific result, but we want to exercise this framework over a number of sensitivities to see that as we vary the characteristics of the resources, the resources that are online, the transmission projects that may be a part of this um, uh, of this network or that we can see that these are reflected in this framework with this accounting method and, um, and that we see it actually working. And so we're looking at a system, I'm not quite at liberty to say which one yet, but it's a real system. It's large enough to have scale, um, but not too large as to make it, um, you know, too difficult to manage um, of part of the continental US. And we're, we've got in mind a few different scenarios, a today scenario um, to serve as a reference for a familiar working grid where we should see the supply of those services in all of the timeframes and all of the locations outstripping the demand for them in a the sense that we know we've got a reliable grid today. Um, but then looking forward, uh, a near term high IBR penetration scenario and then going in a medium term, a very high penetration scenario where those resources, their characteristics are changing um, in aggregate and that we should see that reflected um, in this method. And so with this, we consider not a new paradigm, I would say, but a tweaked paradigm where, you know, it's the question in, in our minds is no longer about can we get to 100% IBR? Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of other great content um, that ESIG has been delivering over the years and many others where I, I think this group would agree there's no fundamental limit to the amount of IBR that you can have with currently available technology. And you look at actual systems that are have been really pushing it very hard in some places with different, um, there's uh, Kauai, for instance, comes to mind, um, other places in Australia that are really doing this in the field and actually operating. And maybe it's not quite 100% IBR or it's just brief moments of it, but I think we're getting past that and saying, okay, it's not like there's some fundamental limit. It's more about providing locationally sufficient and timely stability services on any grid to cover those planned operating conditions. And so, you know, in, in the, the my stick figure illustration here is just kind of a changing of the conversation. And to do that effectively, I think these services, we need to have them rigorously defined. There's been a lot of great work there. Um, technology agnostic, systematically quantified. I think that third bullet, you know, those those second and third bullets is really what we're focused on here. And that then that framework should be applicable for all grids, all systems. And so having the right framework to enable efficient analysis, enable the, uh, to let the planners know where to focus, what scenarios are at risk, where, um, will, will help us uh, plan the system more effectively. So on that- um, so Matt, let me, this is Nick. I've been, I, been holding off on my color commentary, uh, but I obviously can't help myself. Those of you know me, but so just a few, a few sort of, yeah, color commentary. The, this we're this is an effort, part of ongoing effort by many to bridge the this, for lack of a better word, gap in those fast time frames. You've heard a lot of these seminars. In fact, you've heard <laughs> Deepak, uh, Julia, Matt, and I talk about uh, uh, you know uh, IBR modeling and stability limits and these fast phenomena and FFR and all this good stuff, and yet real planners are faced with systems on a scale, both the the count <laughs> the count of buses, the count of resources, the count of possible futures, the count of operating conditions that uh, 
that you are obliged to take into consideration when we figure out what, you know, what do you need is where we're wrestling with this. And, you know, historically, some of these locational and, and, and temporal things have not, you know, in some sense come to a head. Either the spatial aspect has been dealt with because the temporal aspect is simple or slow. <laughs> Uh, and, and none of those, that old construct that let us get away with not having to worry so much about either, it was either locational or temporal, but not both. And somehow or other, that world has changed and we're looking to make this framework work for large systems. We, uh, you know, subject to the two bullets on Matt's, on Matt's cartoon here. Um, and it's uh, it's got a lot of a lot of arms and legs. You know, I had somebody describe a problem here. We're trying to we're trying to compress Jello in a slinky right now, and and uh, as an industry, we need ways to contain that. So that's where we're coming from, and we're pretty excited about this. So back to you, Matt. My sole color comment. Hey, thanks, Nick. Uh, I think that sums it up well. Um, I just like to to give a shout out to our, our sponsors here. Um, you know, this is part of a larger project with the Department of Energy and and ESIG, and um, and then just again to thank this team, uh, Nick Miller with Hickory Ledge and Deepak with EPRI, um, for for all the valuable contributions to this effort and to the industry. Thank you, thank you, Matt, Nick, and Deepak. Um, we have some time for questions. Um, so I know we were not deeply looking into costs, but I'll still ask the question. Maybe you have some thoughts. Uh, the first question, the most popular one, is: Do you think adding costs for these services will boost or kill uh, renewable energy? Um, as the use of these services uh, is now the use uh, they use the services provided by synchronous generators for free. Anyone else want to take that? <laughs> it's a hard one. Yeah, I mean, it, so the, the economic aspect of this is, uh, is of course, very real and, and a major motivator, really, for, for this work. And I think when you look at the this broader effort um, from the, the DOE, it's in a markets um, project in which the market for these services is um, you know is really a big component and in, in a, a focus of not this effort but the broader effort. And so I think where it comes where where our role to play here is well you can't have uh, to, so to the extent that markets are efficient at procuring what you need generally um, you can't run a market if you don't know what you need or if you don't have a way to measure it and do that uniformly and, and repeatably. And so I think that's our role. It's kind of a precursor in this to say, can we talk about this in a, in a very specific um, cons and consistent way and quantify that and then downstream, um, then that would enable the potential for markets. And you know, to the question of what those markets would do to the value of these services, um, I'll leave to someone else. I, 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 think I, they, few, uh, I got some more co <laughs> maybe color commentary on that. You know, there's a subtext in that question that, you know, the old, the, the, the history with synchronous machines, they provided these services uh, to themselves and it came, uh, and a lot of that practice it evolved over a hundred years and indeed much of that practice predated uh, sort of ans paid ancillary services. Uh, and we designed the power system with those, the attributes of synchronous machines as a physical given. This is what you got to work with. We designed the system around it. Uh, it without ever thinking about the, the, you know, inertia from the point of view of it actually being a service, it was a thing. It was an attribute of the system. Now we find that that attribute is kind of a two-edged sword. We always designed, right, the inertia of synchronous machines dictated all sorts of stability problems. Uh, 
that we built the system around. So now we have evolution to a new system. Uh, I think that there is legitimate grounds here to ask these market questions, absolutely, but they aren't that deeply interwoven. What you need from the system to make it work reliably uh, is something is really what we're focused on. Exactly how you are sure that you've gotten what you need and it is a separate question. And some of that is indeed markets, but not all of it. Some of this is going to be by fiat, just as it has always been for 120 years. Some of those attributes are in there because this is what's needed to make the system work. So I'm a markets believer, but I don't believe all things have to revert to markets. Okay, enough color commentary. I think there's also an, there's an aspect there that we've we, we we sometimes assume, and it's it's just subconscious, right? Like if, especially if you look at the energy that comes out of the rotating mass of a machine when an event occurs, we. We, we tend to assume that, oh, you know, we've got that energy for free, but in, in effect, that energy was put into that machine while we were starting it up, while it was accelerating. So there was fuel to a certain extent being consumed in order to get that energy. And then after that, it it, it stays for, for a while. And then whenever there's an event occurs. Now, when you look at an inverter-based resource, you're displacing the time of use of a certain amount of energy, whereas in a machine you would use that energy in the startup period to, to bring it up to speed. Maybe in an inverter-based resource, rather than using it at the startup period, you're just using that at a different point in time when the event occurs. So there's that aspect also that we sometimes have to keep in mind that it's from a machine, although we might think it is coming automatically, it's coming, so, so to speak, free of cost. Uh, it, it's only free of cost when we are using it. It's not free of cost when it was put into the machine. Thanks. Um, so the next question is, uh, do we expect the services to always be linearly additive? Seems like potential nonlinear interactions would greatly complicate uh, the accounting uh, exercise. Yes, that is a, a great point. Um, you know, my my simple brain likes to think in linear in, in linear um, ways, even though this is a very highly nonlinear um, problem. That is something we have our eye on, frankly. And as we proceed with this, so in the next step, we're going to maybe I'll say a little bit more about how we're going to get to an answer because we don't really have. A, a, a rigorous answer right here and now we're kind of we've got the framework and the next step is we're going to exercise this framework on a real system and get real numbers populate these tables and then run a lot of simulation dynamic simulations of the events and see how it syncs up and works so that is our plan and that's when we'll have a much better answer to what is a really great question about you know how does this method how well does this method work you know, our suspicion is, you know, what we're trying to do here is capture enough of the big pieces, the big elements that impact whether, whether the system is stable or not. And we know we're not going to get everything. We know we're not going to get the nonlinearities out of this and that there are going to be compromises. We just feel that those compromises are worth making because of the speed and scale that it allows you to achieve and kind of assessing this. And so, for instance, in this summation of services uh, within a particular group, you're going to get an answer, but it's not going to be a take it to the bank answer. It's going to be a, okay, we've got ample supply of these services. We're not worried about that in this scenario. We really are worried about this scenario where we're showing deficits of services, of grid services, and particular in region X, Y, and Z, let's go zoom into that and let's focus our study effort and our other simulation tools there. Great. I'll, I'll ask one more and then we'll wrap up because we're running against the time. Um, can the location groupings change based on model assumptions, um, dispatch of units and things like that? <laughs> 
Great. Yeah, great question. Can can the location can the groupings change dependent on depending on um, you know other factors the the commitment of resources online or the contingency deck that's being evaluated. Um, yes, and actually from our kind of experimentation on a small scale of that algorithm, we can see that happening. The, it's another question of whether we actually want to run with that. If we have our groups morphing and, and, and changing shape a lot, um, there's a price to pay in terms of kind of the complex, it's this complexity versus accuracy um, balance that we're trying to achieve. And so I, I think the question is is spot is spot on and, and indicates that yes, there are changes, whether it's a contingency like the topology actually changing, or even just what resources are online or what characteristics those resources have that can change the way things want to be grouped. I think that is a physical reality. Um, it's just another question of how. How do we acknowledge that or how do we play with that? There might be um, some places where we where we want to fix the groupings uh, for the sake of a, a simpler and faster analysis, or, or maybe we don't. I think our work later this year um, will shed more light on that. Right, we're slightly over time, so I think we're going to wrap up. Um, Matt, Nick, uh, Deepak, uh, thank you for a very informative presentation. Uh, this work, work uh, obviously has generated lots of questions uh, and uh, it will continue and we'll, hopefully we'll hear more about uh, this work wrapping up in the future webinars. Uh, there was a question in the chat about when this will be published, uh, where um, the timeline is uh, by the end of the year. We are hoping to have this um, task force wrapped up. Uh, so, um, kind of look out for future webinars and, and the report from this work. Um, so, in the meantime, I also encourage all interested in uh, this, rep uh, this work, ESIG members, to join the task force and provide your input and feedback. Um, I think there are a lot of good material in the questions, actually. Um, as I mentioned earlier, an email will go out once the video has been posted and we'll get the responses to all your unanswered questions uh, posted as quickly as possible. Uh, we appreciate your engagement and if you would like to stay engaged, uh, I would like to invite you to participate in the next ESIG webinar on April 25th, uh, where Anna Lafayanis from EPRI will talk about flexibility from hydrogen um, and uh, also very much related topic to today's webinar, uh, which is GPST ASIC webinar in uh, on May 14th, uh, where Edward uh, Farley from a National Grid uh, Electricity System Operator in Great Britain will be talking about market products for stability services. Uh, further information on all ESIG webinars can be found on our website at ESIG.energy um, under events, um, and you're all invited to attend. Information on all GPST webinars also can be found on globalpst.org uh, webpage. Uh, again, Nick, uh, Deepak, uh, Matt, um, thanks so much uh, for being here today and for your timely webinar. Thank you all for your interest and for sticking with us for another extra three minutes. Uh, we will look forward to seeing you again in the near future. And in the meantime, take care, stay safe, and thanks again for your participation. Bye now. Thanks, everyone.